Hi, everybody, and welcome to another video of the History of Fashion and Costume Design series. My name is Bridget, and today we are going to evaluate Mughal Empire dress and costuming from 1530 to 1707, uh, with a little more emphasis on the 17th century. So this is a very very brief overview of the Mughal Empire as it was very complex and vast. Um, but the Mughals, a Persian Arabic word for Mongols, were Muslims who created an empire in India, holding power for roughly 200 years between the 16th and 18th centuries. Founded by Babur, a descendant of Tamar, the last great Central Asian conqueror in the Mongol tradition, and of Genghis Khan on his mother's side, uh, reigned from 1526 to 30. Babur's grandson Akbar defeated the Afghans and firmly established Mughal supremacy in northern India, bringing the empire to the height of its power and wealth. And just a quick fun fact, uh, the Taj Mahal was built between 1631 and 1632 by the order of Mughal Empire Shah Jahan. And over on the left-hand side, I have this map that I found, and I really liked how it includes um, in green the current country's boundaries. Uh, so you can see the extent um, and expansion of the Mughal Empire during this time. Moving forward, uh, this slide here is kind of looking at this crossover of architecture, painting, and fashion. Um, Mughal period was referred to as the golden period of Indian history. Nur Jahan, the wife of Jahangir, was the inventor of brocade. And materials used during the Mughal period range from fine muslin to heavy brocades. And silk was commonly used for king's dress. Gold and silver threads were used for stitching and embroidery. And in architecture, painting, and even in fashion, we can see this blend of Indian and Persian styles. The dominated pattern of the time was paisley, which is from Persian influence, and this was used in architectural decoration and in clothing pattern. Mughal India also had a thriving manufacturing industry as producing a massive quantity of handloom textiles for the Indian Ocean economy. And over on the left, I have these portraits um, to put into perspective of who Nur Jahan was, uh, what she looked like. And I really like this image here where my mouse is. And she's holding a portrait of her husband, Jahan Gir. Um, I find that really interesting. And then below, this is a brocade from India from the 17th century that's still in very, very great condition. So to jump right into Mughal men's clothing, we're going to first start with the jama. Um, it originated in Persia and Central Asia, worn both short and long. In Persian, the word jama translates to garment, robe, gown, or coat. And this is a side-fastening coat with a tight-fitting bodice, usually accustomed with a flared skirt that reaches the knees. And this is the earliest form of a coat in India. And according to the historian Guri Day, Hindus would fasten the jama on the left side of the body while Muslims would tie it on the right hand side, which I think is very interesting. And hakta is a long piece of fabric and cloth used to tie around the waist of the jama. And you can see this here uh, from this portrait painting from 1803. Um, and I have these two examples um, to this Day that are still in really great condition um, from the 17th century um, and 16th century here of these morning coats and the jama. And the Ankarka, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, it's an upper garment worn by both sexes, yet historically worn by men over pajamas. Uh, the front overlaps and the entirety of the garment is wrapped around the body, fastened with knots or buttons called guntis. Uh, the angarka can be worn either formally or daily, and this was made in various fabrics such as brocade, silk, velvet, muslin, and jamdani. Uh, it was commonly decorated or highly embellished with embroidery such as zari, which is thread of gold or silver. Um, and I do have these examples of the angarka over here on the right. Um, this one 
I believe is from the 17th century, and then the one on the right is from the 18th century, made of cotton at the Met Museum. Um, the dhoti is a long loincloth worn by Hindu men. And this is a versatile garment, as it can be worn a variety of ways, depending on comfort or occasion. Um, several Indian gods, including Vishnu and Krishna, are depicted wearing the dhoti. And the pajama is long, loose trousers, usually made of thin material, occasionally wound around the lower leg. And these were usually snug down to the ankle. And men would wear these trousers with their pajamas. Um, and these images that I have over here, these top two are modern um, replications of the dhoti that I just found online. I could not find any um, primary sources that had the example of the dhoti in it. Uh, this one here I circled in yellow. Um, it's a man that's wearing a form of the dhoti. Um, and then over on the right, I have a picture of these men wearing the pajamas that you can see underneath. I think this is like a translucent skirt um, that I think is really interesting. Um, and we are going to be looking at something called a yalik, which is like a translucent type of undergarment for a woman. So I was like, oh, like maybe there's some uh, crossover there, which I think is really interesting. Um, moving forward, the pagri is the traditional turban, and it was during the reign of Akbar, the, the typical Mughal tr turban was popularized, which was wrapped directly on the head. And this was a large self-draping stripe of cotton between 5 to 25 yards long, wound in various styles, often with one end hanging down the back. Um, this lacked a kalpak, which is a Turkish high-crowned cap traditionally worn by the Bulgarians, Turks, Ukrainians, and Russians. And I have an ex example of the kalpak over here. And these two um, miniature portraits um, from Mughal India depict um, Jahangir wearing the pagri and then a portrait of Murad uh, also wearing one as well. That is accustomed with a feather. And for Mughal men's shoes, uh, it's the Mojari and their Mojari are slippers that are believed to originate in the Mughal Empire. And these were made of one piece of leather or firm textile embellished and decorated with colors and occasionally gems. And I have an example here that is with the red background. And footwear was also called Juti, uh, worn by Mughal men and Examples of juti include the kash, which is worn by nobles and kings, uh, the sharvan, which is the curling tong uh, that's fixed to the toe that I believe I have uh, right at the top left here that's in that gold embellished style. The Salem Shahai, which is decorated in gold, which I believe we could argue is also this. I am not 100% sure, though. And the Kurd Nau, which is very lightweight, made of kid leather. And both men and women wore decorated shoes with upturned toes, which is a Persian fashion. Um, and down on the bottom right, I have these details of Shah Jahan and Dari Siko in uh, 1650 um, and their shoes, like little details. <laughs> Moving forward, um, I really wanted to include like Mughal women's uh, beauty routines and beauty standards because I found it very complex and beautiful and very interesting. Um, so imperial court women would practice elaborate beauty, beauty rituals consisting of 16 different celebrated routines. So eyebrows would be threaded, kajal, which is Arabic for coal, like eyeliner, um, would be applied to the eyelids. Teeth were whitened with misi, which is chickpea flour, and nath, which is the nose piercing would be worn and studded with diamonds and um, gold and usually a gift from a husband to their bride. A uh, beetle leaf, which is a pepper plant, would be used to redden the lips and possibly as a deodorant. And mehendi, which is similar to henna, would be used as a tattoo and to ink the skin. Um, and I found this chart um, here, and I just found it on Google, so I really hope it is uh, reliable for this presentation. But I just thought it was really interesting that I had this portrait of a woman and it was kind of labeling the different um beauty uh routines i guess you could call it um as well as like different um 
vocabulary words for like their shoes and fashion. So you have the yalik that I kind of mentioned earlier, the like transparent kind of cloth that was typically an undergarment and then the jutis and then you have jewelry like the bangles and um we'll get into more of that <laughs> yeah I just thought that was really interesting and then I also have um this woman being perfumed from the 17th century and then a portrait of a woman also from the 17th century So the peshwas is a loose jama-like robe fastened at the front and ties at the waist. It's usually high-waisted and long-sleeved. And occasionally several transparent peshwas were layered and um, women would wear this over a sholi, which is a blouse. Um, the peshwas was said to be introduced to India under Babur's reign. Um, and I have two examples of the peshwas here. Um, the one on the bottom right, I do not remember the exact date. It was between the 16th and 18th century. And then this one here is a little more current. Uh, this one's the 18th century. And then I have two silk choli from India, um, 18th and 19th centuries. And these are both housed at the Met. And now to jump into the Yalik. And this is the only image I could find. I only found these two images. Um, really unfortunate. Um, but the yalik is a type of undergarment which sticks to the body and is uh, has this length down to the ankles. And yaliks were worn underneath gowns and peshwas. And yaliks are characterized as a long under tunic, usually with short sleeves or sleeveless. And like men, women would also wear pajamas, the loose fitting trousers. And you can see it pictured below down here. Moving forward uh, a little bit more, uh, I really wanted to include headwear because in my last um, previous video that I went over, I went over Mongol fashion. Uh, I brought up the bakta, which is a headdress worn by elite Mongol women, and it continued through the Mughal Empire. Um, the hat is a little bit different. Um, there's different characterizations. This one's a little more short and stout. Um, but I found it really interesting because Mughal women continue to wear the bakta, which is highly pop popularized in the Yuan dynasty of the Mongol Empire. And women also would wear turbans, which were decorated with jeweled bands, pinned jewelry, and other forms of ornamentation. And here is a oval portrait of a woman in a jeweled kalpak or bakta uh, from Mughal India um, from 1740 to 50. And then, ah! I jumped way too far. Okay. Um, ornamentation and jewelry, I also really wanted to touch into. And there's a technique called the kundam technique, and it is gold that is beaten into a narrow, 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 <laughs> a narrow foil um, layered over a gemstone. And I just have a bunch of images here that I wanted to just throw in. Um, for instance, I have the Mughal India bracelet from the 18th century. And I have a couple examples of Mughal nose rings that were crafted out of gold and studded with various precious gemstones, um, which are all very beautiful. And then I believe this is my last slide. Um, these are just some textiles that I really wanted to throw in there. Um, we have a part of a sari and silk metal thread from the 18th to 19th century. We have a pakta, which is that sash with the floral border that would be worn with the jama um, tied around the waist. And then we have a fragment of a turban cloth from the early 19th century. And then we have hand painted Indian cotton fabric um, from the 16th, 17th or no, 17th, 18th century. Um, so yes, I believe. And then this is my work cited page. Um, these were all really, really great reads. I highly recommend The Art of Cloth in Mughal India. Um, really, really great if you want to get into textiles and everything. Um, but yeah, I highly recommend all of these readings. Um, I thank you for joining me for another video. I learned a lot um, by doing this research and I still have so much more to learn and understand um, and work on my pronunciations more and more each day. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day. Um, thank you. See you soon. Bye.